This is Karen with NewClevelandRadio.net, and it is time for Avoid the Maze. And if you're watching this on YouTube, you might notice that I have a new background, and it is a maze. And the reason I decided to start using this is everyone, from the day they're born, their life is a maze. You know, um, I remember when I had my first child, I was told, you're going to take them home, you're going to put them on a schedule. And he's going to eat and sleep and do all these things. No, he didn't. Um, he was not a good sleeper, a terrific eater. Um, and yes, he did hit his milestones, but, you know, he didn't hit them exactly when that chart said he was going to. So first time, mom, I was a worry wart. Second child, 15 years later, um, I didn't want to know about the milestones. I said, you're going to tell me anyways. Um, and for the first six years, he was this sweet, happy, extroverted uh, kid. He loved everything. So you know how they say the kids are picky before they're maybe eight or nine years old with their food? Oh, no, no, not him. He ate broccoli. He ate Brussels sprouts. Um, it was only when he was six years old and we were told he was on the autism spectrum, that life changed. But it had nothing to do with what he wanted. It was what society was telling us to do for him. My guest today is Natalie Pelto. And I found Natalie on podmatch.com, uh, my favorite place to go to find wonderful individuals. And as I read Natalie's bio, it's like, oh my gosh, like we have something in common here. And it's a conversation so needed. Last month was Autism Awareness Month. Sadly, we only talk about it for a month and then we try to forget it. Um, but give us a little bit of background. How did you get to being um, someone who has so much knowledge in autism in the spectrum. Yes. Well, so my story was that I think that a, a story that so many people can relate to. I had a beautiful boy, perfect in every way. And even the pediatrician, whenever she examined him, oh, he's so perfect. And at around two years old, he tended to suffer from a little bit of extra infections like chest infections and coughs. And his diet was okay at some points. And then it started to go down. That was a big one for us. He was one of those picky eaters. And so, and in, in his defense, so were me and my husband. <laughs> so, I'm not going to say that I was any better, uh, but we started to notice that he wasn't, he was really sick quite often. So I brought him to my family physician and she was amazing. I was in healthcare. So I was very trusting of the medical system back then. And she right away at 18 months old could see that there were a couple of variations with him. He wasn't mimicking anymore. At one point he had started saying words like mama, dada, and then he regressed. And I'm sure that that is something that you see a lot because we know that right now, 90% of autism out there is regressive autism. Right. And then he wasn't speaking and she sent us to a pediatrician appointment that I thought was for speech. I was going in there for a speech therapy consultation and referral, but I needed the pediatrician for this. And no, the pediatrician took one look at him, did a few things. And she said, oh no, no, I'm almost certain that your child has nonverbal autism. And for me, We've not really had that in our family. We, as a healthcare worker, the only time that I had been exposed to autism was on the severe end of the spectrum of special needs. And my brain was really struggling with comprehending what was happening. Sure. And society has a very interesting way of treating autism. So I left there kind of like with a broken heart feeling like my child had pretty much died because, right. and for some people that's not the case. So, but for me, in my experience, my child would not have a life at all because of my personal projection and lens of the world that I witnessed. And interestingly, they really pushed for diagnosis quickly. My son was two. And I said, well, I'd kind of like to wait. I'd like to see, you know, let's put him in speech. Let's do the things. 
And I think that you have a lot of families that are very eager for a diagnosis so that they can get the extra help that they need. And then you have other families who are very, like myself, was not ready for that type of diagnosis sure. because of what it also meant. And it meant for me and my, again, lens of the world that I would be wrapped in a world of constant appointments and of constant assessments and of constant uh, separation from the world. So that's like what I feel society gives us a lot with autism. And I see this now with a lot of my families uh, is that they feel very secluded because of our medical system and confidentiality. They see the numbers like we just you just said it. Autism month just went by. Yep. The numbers are now one in 36 for eight year olds. That's a huge delay, by the way, four year olds. And what I'm seeing is much higher. But it's really interesting because none of these people know each other. They have no way to access each other as support to see what is really happening. If there are success stories, if severe autism can see different outcomes. In the time where I started my journey, there was nothing that talked about any type of better outcome. You were dealt the card that you had. If you had a child right. who was high functioning, amazing. You were, you were likely going to have a better outcome. You needed the diagnosis for extra support. But when you had a child of the severity like mine that could elope, that could not, that could not even answer to his own name, the words institutionalized, iPad communication therapy, like these are the words that every mother does not want to hear. And it was absolutely debilitating. So my choices were this. As someone in healthcare, I could go through the process of the assessment process that would take years. Even then, now we're looking at two years. Back then, it was roughly six months to a year. And this is 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago. No, about 10 years ago. And interestingly enough, I was like, you know what? Like, I know as being in healthcare that they're not going to give me any information that right. I don't already know, which kind of really sped up my process. And that was, a, that was in service to me to know that healthcare did not have the answer or the resources to help me. And so I started really diving deep into the, the thought, I have to start thinking outside the box to help him. And so I had to walk away from society. I don't know if you've ever heard of the hero's journey, but it, they've written many books about it. And so one of the first key components is as you, as humanity or a human goes on a hero's journey, the first thing is actually to remove themselves from the mainstream. Wow. And, okay. it, it, and it's so interesting because you cannot continue, you cannot get well in the environment that you were sick. And my, and so people understand like severe autism does not look like high functioning autism as well. Like we're looking at someone who can run away into traffic, right. escape the house and get lost in the woods. Th those news stories that you see of drownings, those are like our worst fear. And they're usually from nonverbal severe autism. And I did not want that for my child. And so my journey, if it like to bring us back to the question was that was where knowledge came. I had a lot of knowledge in the human body. I basically spent 21 years looking inside because that's what I did. I worked in diagnostics. So health was something like I under understood that we didn't have anymore in our society. You know, so <laughs> as, as I said to you before we got started, um, my son was diagnosed in his school. Okay. It happened. Um. One day they were there was a fire drill and the sound of the bell just mortified him, even though he had heard it previously, okay? And he went underneath the desk and would not move. And it took the teacher and a couple of other six-year-olds to pull him out as he was crying, kicking, and screaming. That same day they called in the school psychologist she did some tests. We got called and said, you need to come to the school now. Well, when the school called you like that, what oh, do yeah, you, you think? <laughs> You're sick. Your child is very ill. And I said, if he's that ill, call an ambulance and we'll meet him at the hospital. And it was like, no, 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 calm down. You just need to come in. And we came in and here's my happy-go-lucky kid. Okay, because as soon as the fire drill was over, <clears throat> he was fine. <clears throat> but then he went and played with the social worker. That's what he thought he was doing. He was in great mood. And he runs up to me and his dad tells us everything he's been doing all day long, short of the fire drill. So the psychologist sat there and she said, <clears throat> why don't you tell your mommy and daddy what happened? 
when the bell went off and um, he looked at us and he goes, we all had to go outside. That's what he remembered. His perception. Yeah. So I, we were told at that meeting, we believe he's autistic overnight. Like, what does that mean? Yeah. And he can't come back until you have a diagnosis. Wow. And my husband and I just looked at each other, you know, um, you know, five years going through infertility, having this wonderful kid, like now what do we do? And so unlike you who didn't really want the diagnosis, um, we said, well, the school says we have to, we ran and found a doctor and got the diagnosis and got him on medication and got him in therapies. And all of a sudden we saw this change in him. And sadly to those of you who have children on the lower end of the spectrum, all of a sudden that's what we were witnessing and it made no sense. Mm -hmm. I see this a lot, actually. Um, I see a lot of pressure, and I think that this is something we we did touch on briefly, and I'm sure we'll dive deep and in, deeper into it. I do see it even in my families when there are 40 hours a week of you know harsh, well, I shouldn't say harsh, intensive therapy. Uh, there is often such an exhaustion and so much that goes through that and this expectation. It's like I I think I saw a meme one day, it's or or someone commented something along the lines of my child is in so much therapy that they're not even getting to be kids. That is such an important yeah. part of development and brain development and understanding social cues. Training someone into habits is not is often going to have a detrimental effect. Well, which makes sense that, to yeah. what you're saying. And that's when we sort of started, you know, pulling back because what we found from community and I don't now I can say I don't blame them because they didn't know any better but they didn't want their kids to play with our son anymore I mean and he was always the first one invited someplace and now he's not invited and if we invited somebody over the parents said they had to come too and not that they weren't welcome, but now not only is my child has this time to play, now I have to entertain people, you know? And it was like, can't I have that respite of time? Yeah, it's true. And so many families feel this way right now. And the thing is, is that we're at a point where when I talk to teachers and I talk to like they're seeing such an elevated number of not just autism, although I had a conversation with one of the um, speech therapists that I know, she said, we've had so many referrals come in. It's absolutely crazy, but it's like the learning disabilities. Like we're looking at 50% or more with like special IEPs and learning programs. There's there, there has to be some sort of conversation on what's happening with our poor kids too. And so for us, like the knowledge came by accident to go back to the question that you had asked. And the knowledge kind of came by accident when, of course, back then Dr. Google was new. There was no social media. Nobody was talking about autism. If you, you almost felt shame. And I mean, right. your son is, is, is a lot older. So that's like kind of coming back to what you're saying is, not only do you feel shame because as moms, one of the most common emotions that we get when we get an autism diagnosis for our children is guilt. And so if there are moms out there and you feel guilty, it's not your fault. We've been literally living in a society that promotes like very harsh environments that are affecting autism and mental health and wellness in a whole kind of wrapped up package. Uh, so I want them to know it's not their fault, but like the shame of trying to interact with other people. And then we have judgment from other families. And now though, back then it was such a judgment. Now we look at it. And if we look at at least one in 36 older kids and what we're seeing is everyone knows someone now, right? Before right. not everybody knew someone. Now you were going, your child was going to hang out with a special needs child, even when I was going through it. But now it's like, it's very kind of normal for you well, to know someone with autism. And you know, what's interesting is that when my son turned 17 or 18, uh, he joined one of the national uh, organizations for autism and he became a public speaker 
Um, but he was at one event and one of the directors came up to him and said, you know, Alex, I know you haven't really been dating, but I have the perfect girl for you. Now he's very high functioning at this time. And he says, okay, well, yeah, I'm willing to meet somebody. And God loved this young girl. She was somewhere between the low end and high functioning, a sweetheart. He was willing to be her friend, but he said to them afterwards, just because I'm on the spectrum, does that mean I can only date people on the spectrum? And this director looked at him and she said, you'll have a better life that way. And he goes, no, Why? I don't think so. Oh my goodness. Yeah. He that's... says, I'm working so hard through my differences. He said, that's not what I want now because I'm a public speaker, I support all these individuals. I understand them. Yeah. And he said, and I'm willing to be her friend and work with her, but don't expect that I'm going to date somebody just because they're on the spectrum. Exactly. I totally agree with that. So I just spoke at uh, the ICANN 2023 at the International Conference for Autism. And what I, the types of, and I don't want to say the types of people, but the people that I met there uh, and that were advocating not just inclusion, but understanding, it really changed my lens of the world. And so now I can see that perspective because again, like in healthcare, what I saw was suffering, but now I get to see that especially high functioning individuals also suffer in a way where they're not included like this. And it's so interesting, right? Because no matter what, at the end of the day, they're suffering, whether they're yeah. high functioning or low functioning, they have their own version of what that looks like. Yeah, it was such an eye opener to me to see that and to meet high, very high functioning individuals who absolutely could, without a doubt, hold relationships that are probably going to be the I'm going to say this nicely, like the better half of the relationship, yeah. right? <laughs> so I, I think that it's, it's so interesting that we end up in this space where we now have a society that has completely shifted a little bit from autism, not being, now it's being normalized. I, I, I don't know how to write that, how to say that it's being normalized and inclusive. And in some ways that's absolutely so beneficial, sure. but, but what we're not seeing in what I'm seeing and what I teach and my education around autism and health is that I'm not seeing a lot of, everybody wants to address the external environment. Everybody wants everyone to be inclusive of autism. And I think that's absolutely necessary, but what about the autism internal environment where anxiety, mental health, and, and like for low functioning individuals, the lifespan is 36. That's where my, that's where my expertise right now are highly focused. Sure is I want those low functioning that are parents are being told, you know what, ABA can't even help you anymore. We want to institutionalize your child because they can't, they, they just cannot be in society. I want that to change to, wow, your child gets to be so independent. They have these beautiful gifts and they can put them out in the world. So my goal right now is I educate mostly children and they're getting older and older. So I think that's really exactly. fun in my program. I love that. I have some nine-year-olds and 12-year-olds starting. Uh, and I think it's amazing because they now get to just like, they all have gifts. Like when I see my son and I think of how much he could not even answer to his own name, he could not look up, he could not, he was obsessive with toys. Like it was, if you took a, a specific toy away, it would be complete meltdowns. He couldn't transition into specific areas or places or situations when I think of that individual, which it's funny because yesterday I was just looking through paperwork to find he's going on a trip, first trip on his own flying. And I'm looking for his birth certificate and I find uh, his his assessments of like severity, right? And he was like considered here in Canada, we have a level five, which is considered absolutely the worst and needs to be addressed. And, uh, and to see that his like just a few other pages down, he had hit all of his goals and all we had access to, which is kind of interesting because I live in a small town where I live, the only access would be to occupational therapy and speech therapy. Okay. And so we only had speech therapy once a week. So how did we get my son from, and that's where a lot of people like, they're like, I don't understand, but then they see the evidence and they're like, how did that happen? And we focused on lifestyle. 
And that's the truth. And we focused on diversity. We focused on supporting um, healthy brain development. And that's something that I've actually seen working as well with adults is a heavy focus on gut microbiome diversity and supporting a healthy uh, brain and uh, focusing on things that are very deficient in our world. You know, it's interesting because when my son turned 13 years old, um, we were working with uh, the Board of Mental Health here in Cleveland because we were told he could get services and they saw him as high functioning. And so they got him services because he loved baseball so much. We're going to teach eye contact through baseball lessons, which was perfect. perfect because he was doing something that he loved and he was learning along the way. Um, but a year later, uh, we were called into uh, the office because they had done a psychiatric review. Now, this psychiatrist sits us down with Alex there, which you'll know why I wasn't happy about that. She opened up her thing and she said, no, I'm just going to close this. And there was a gentleman out in the hallway sweeping. And she said, Alex, stand up and look out the window there. And he did. And he said, what am I looking at? She said, do you see that man sweeping? He goes, yeah. That's your future. At oh some goodness. point, yeah. At some point, your parents will get you enlisted in a halfway house. Forget baseball, Alex. You're never going to play baseball. Alex, forget any kind of job with your music. Not going to happen. With that, my husband said a few unkind words and ran Good. out of the room. Good. Alex went to follow and she yells at him and says, you must sit down now. We're talking about your future. You better understand it now. And with that, Alex said, no, I'm going out to help my dad. Yeah. And she said, it's not your responsibility. And that's when all of a sudden it dawned on me, what are we doing to my child? Yes. You know, like he's got abilities. Why are we telling him the best they he can do is go sweep? I mean, if that really were the best for him, I would have been excited. Okay. But yeah. I knew it wasn't. So after all that, we cut all ties with them, even though we were told, oh, you have a scholarship for him. I don't care. I don't want him any part of this. And we started treating him differently. Yeah. And we started asking him, what do you want to be involved in when you get to high school? And what he wanted to be involved in really didn't work because as much as he loves sports, he knew how to play at the major league area. He didn't understand why the high school taught it differently. Why yeah. you have to swing, even if the ball is in near you. And he tried out and he played for a half a year and he goes, I don't want any part of this. Yeah. And he gets to make that decision, right? Like that's exactly. the amazing part. And so to make a long story short, what we started seeing was, even though he was mourning some of the things he couldn't get to because he he just didn't have the mindset to say, okay, I've got to do this differently. He said, I'm still going to get into sports, which he did. And he's in sports now working. He loves what he does. He has a creative mind. He lives on his own. Isn't that what all parents want from a child? Yes. For but them to I love their life. But too many of us fall into that category where we say, oh, this is what they told us. Yes. And we fall for it. Yeah. No, because, because we have given a lot, a lot of foundation to the medical system that don't understand autism. We've given them um, a lot of power in an area that they actually very much. And the thing is, is like, I have a business partner who's a physician and she is amazing, but she also has an interest in things that are not necessarily the norm for a physician, right. yeah. but that's the truth. And that's just it. And, and I, you know, I try to teach the kids exactly what you did 
because the kids that I see have the most results are often when parents meet them where they're at and decide how can we make this fun and how can we make it so you love it. And when I saw at ICANN, one of the most kind of emotional presentations, it was a study that was done about um, high functioning autistic individuals that had overcome a lot of their, um, like their symptoms that where they couldn't be independent. And one of the biggest key factors were that parents pushed and pushed and pushed when they were working with therapies and when they were working with physicians. And at the end, one of the children was, it was called happiness, autism and happiness. And one of the children said, well, he was not a child, he was a teenager, but he said, I just, I've done all of this and I feel like it's still not good enough. And that's such a profound thing. That was such a profound moment for everyone in the audience, because the truth is the faster we can meet our kids where they're at and give them the life that they want, not that we want. And that's a right. hard one for parents, um, the faster that they actually thrive. Well, and I noticed that with my son that, you know, trying to teach him, put your things away. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, here's the vacuum cleaner. Go vacuum your room. That was very difficult for him, but for many reasons. And we just learned now since he moved away a thousand miles to be exact, um, that he also didn't think he had to do those things because he saw that if he didn't do it, mom did it. And so he was acting like a normal teenager. But at the time, I didn't understand that. I thought he just like, you know, just didn't do it. But now what he's explained to us that he's on his own is I'm even though I see that my laundry has to be done, if I'm not in the mood to do it, I just don't do it. He said, but when I lived at home, but you knew there was a shirt in that laundry that I wanted to wear tomorrow you and you didn't want to see me be upset. You did the laundry. So I had that shirt. He said, now. It's all on me. Mm -hmm. And I realized that if we hadn't fallen into that category of parents who felt, oh, the doctors, the therapists, um, society is telling us to do these things for our kids, yes. that maybe we would have seen a change sooner. It doesn't make any difference. He is who he is. And he even says, um, you know, mom, I still have those feelings for meltdowns. I still get upset, yeah. but I control them. He says, yeah. and then I get in the car to drive home from work and I call you and I rant and rave at you. He said, because it's safe. That's something else that we don't talk about are safe areas. Yeah, actually the entirety of everything I teach in the beginning throughout is always about safety. And it makes such a difference because when people feel safe, they can be vulnerable, right? Right. And for autism, their entire lives, unfortunately, society kind of makes it feel like autism is not safe. Like all of a sudden you have to have parents come with other kids to hang out with them. Like everything that we do is around, I know in some ways, if we have eloping kids that we do want to be present so that right. they don't run away. But in a lot of the cases is that we're kind of promoting a feeling that as a, as a human being, they themselves are not safe. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And I totally, that's such a big thing. It's such a big deal. So my son was diagnosed in 1996. And I believe the numbers back then were like one in 150. Um, and, you know, I remember us scratching our heads. How can this be happening? But right after that incident in the psychiatrist's office, my husband was taking, went back to graduate school and he was fearing taking his boards at the end mm. because he's not a memorizer, never has been. And he was going to have to sit there and write and write and write. And he went to the Dean and he said, I'm really concerned. I'm acing everything. I'm not going to be able to pass my boards. And he said, well, why not? He said, because you're going to put me in a room with a notebook, not even a computer. And he's 
His IT was his background. And now you're going to put a pen in my hand that does not feel comfortable. And you're going to ask me to take what's in my brain and write it out. He said, if you had a computer, could you do that? He said, yes, but my grammar is terrible. So you're going to fail me on my grammar. He said, why don't you do yourself a favor? Go back and see your doctor. He said, and he gave him a sealed envelope. He said, don't open it. Take it to your doctor. So he went to his doctor. And what his doctor did was ask him a number of questions. And he did some testing. He said, I can't prove it. But I think you're on the spectrum. Mm. My husband was in his 50s. He was so elated. And I asked him why. He said, because my mother used to always say I was different. Because he'd rather sit in a corner and read a book or take two little cars mm. and sit in a corner and play with them. She said, you always wanted to do things that were so different from everybody, but you were the best behaved. <laughs> yes. My son was kind of the same, actually, when it came to that. Um, he was a very, like, a lot of kids, I, I, I work with a lot of kids who have a lot of aggression and, and a lot of ADHD, because currently that's a higher rate right. of diagnosis. But for my son, he was so closed off you could leave him in a corner and he would just do his own thing. Mind you, he wasn't really perceptive to anything, but he would be closed off in an area for long periods of time. And I have a daughter now and she's like, I was like, wow, the thing that we had you second, <laughs> there would be no others, but uh, <laughs> because she's so different, but yeah, there is this, it, there, this interesting shift in the autism brain. And I love that, you know, adults are feeling like they can get these questions answered now. And now I'm, I'm sure that if your husband went, he would actually have that answer. They have different ways of testing because adult testing was never really a thing prior. Right. And, uh, and now we're seeing a lot of differences, but he's still thriving. And I think that that's like the most important thing, right. Is at the end of the day is seeing our children be able to thrive. And what I want to bring to the table is that Children can thrive in a way that is so beyond what they've been told in a way that could be fun and met at their level. And a lot of it actually has to do with not just the external environment that I see so many associations obsessed with. It's also helpful for their internal environment. And we need to really be matching both environments because how we feel internally reflects how we feel externally. Well, and I think what you're saying is that when our child comes to us and tells us, you know, they feel depressed or anxious, mm -hmm. you know, instead of saying, oh, you shouldn't, because that's what we did in the beginning. You know, we'd say, well, why are you it. depressed? He yeah. didn't know why. He just knew that chemically he was just in a letdown. Um and it finally got to a point when I went to his doctor and I said, how do I respond to this? He said, from now on, just acknowledge it. Say, okay, mm -hmm. if you can explain it to me, explain it to me. If there's something that you need me to do for you, please let me know. And that wasn't easy. It took a number of years before I could do it more successfully. And even today, you know, uh, I get caught up when he'll you know, yeah. be calling me on his way home from work and saying, I made a mistake. I shouldn't have moved here. This is the worst job in the world, whatever. And I don't play into it anymore. No. Vent. That's okay. Yeah. And if there's something I can do, please share it with me. And if there's nothing I can do, I'm your ears. Um, and it's funny because usually by the time he gets home, mm -hmm. he's turning around calling me again and saying, Please ignore everything I said. <laughs> you know, something happened and we all can go through that. I mean, I oh, yeah, I, I think that's a universal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We live in a society currently that really promotes uh, what's the like a type A. I'm going to say it, a yep. type A way of perfectionism. Right. That no one can can step up to, I think, in some ways. And I mean, I think that that's the 
the positives and negatives of having so much connection in the world, right? Like there's so many positives to being on social media, to connecting with other people, to getting to see success stories of what's happening in the autism world. But then there's also this other comparison of, am I doing enough? Am I good enough? And for people who are high functioning, this is something that plays in their minds a lot. Because I see, I, I follow a lot of adult autism accounts because I like to see and learn how high functioning can look because I want that to be like an idea for the people who are coming into my program that can't speak that their children are how mine were I want them to have a vision of like high functioning and and how that can look because a lot of them are, are so in trauma that they can't even envision a world where they can meet their children where they're exactly. at and speak exactly yeah so when did you see the change from from in your son from he went nonverbal, which had to have been a shock and disappointment yes. after talking. Yeah. So for my son, we saw quite a bit of changes. So as soon as I found out that there was something I could do at home, like this was a thing, right? And this is a, a thing about, again, like how, how we're just, we just expect someone else, not expect, we've just been taught. It's actually a learned behavior. I don't want to say that we expect. We have been taught that if something is wrong, we give it to the doctor, they will give us a way to fix it. Right. But we have not, we have almost as, as parents, and I see this a lot, lost that empowerment of knowing how much we actually have control over right. everything at home. So as soon as like, for me, someone gave me the slight inkling of your circumstance can be different. I was like, oh, I'm in. I dove in two feet in. Um, and so for me, who was a picky eater, my husband, who was a picky eater, our lifestyle was not, was a heavily promoting and toxicity, which at the time I had no idea what a toxin was. <laughs> and so we really started to overhaul our lives, what we ate. We started to be more present. Like that was one of the big things. We started to play outside with my son. Nobody had iPads anymore. We played outside instead together. And we started to connect in a different way. So it, it's like, it is a lot of what I teach is the lifestyle pillars. There's not just nutrition in there. There's resilience, understanding stress, learning how to connect and build relationships. All of those aspects are so, so important. So as soon as we brought that in, I'd say that we started to see changes within three to six months. Uh, my son started to make eye contact. And then that was a huge deal because we were like, oh, okay, he's interested. And we, even though I know, like I see this meme all the time, as if you know you're, you're the parent of an autistic child, if it's easier to stay in than to go out, we really promoted relationship building outside of the home. As harder, as much harder as that was, we went to play dates. We went to the areas where he could be exposed to different adaptability and situations that would create not just habit right? Because if you're in habit 100% of the time, this is what therapy teaches and this is what physicians teach. You actually are accessing a different part of the brain. You're actually not learning adaptability. You're uh -huh. not stimulating the amygdala or memory. None of that is happening. So in the end, does that really benefit our kids? In some ways, yes. Like if they, if they can, you know, consistent, but in a lot of ways, when all the focus is there, then no. And so, yeah, so it just kept going. He started to mimic other children. He started to mimic things on television that he would watch on shows. And then I'd say that within about, so at five and a half years old, my son was fully nonverbal. And then when he turned seven and a half, he was released from all care. He was released. I remember taking, they had put our request in for iPad communication therapy, which here in Canada, which this is just to give you an idea of how far behind we are to get access to an AAC machine, which is a, a speech machine, right. and to learn how to use it. The wait is four years. Oh my gosh. Could you imagine not being able to communicate with your child who is like likely now getting a diagnosis at four years old, so you're not gonna get to communicate with them till eight if they cannot progress. That to me is mind blowing. That is. So back then it was a year. They said six months to a year. And I remember answering the phone when they called and say, oh, you have, uh, we have your AAC machine, if you would like, or they didn't call it that, that back then, but they said, we have our, your communication device. And I said, I had totally forgotten. And I said, I'm so, I'm so grateful to say this. You can give our spot to someone else. And the girl on the other end of the phone was so like surprised. And she said, that is a very rare thing. We do not see that very often. And she said, I'm so happy for you. 
And it was nice to be acknowledged that right. way. And I mean, I'm sure they were busy and they kept on going on to their next call. But I remember thinking, yes, that was the moment where I was like, this is enough. This is, we did it. Like we can communicate. We are having a great time. My son is like thriving with his social life. And then it just progressively just continued to get better. Now my son absolutely is fully beyond independent. He no longer requires any care at all. Actually, his teachers say that sometimes if he wasn't there, it would be crickets because he's so into participating in the classroom and he's currently like helping other students. Like he's How helping wonderful. Teachers. I know it's so good. So for us, it was such a big difference. And the whole, the whole of it for me, what I would say to the point where he's so independent that he can live a life of his dreams. That's how I like to call it. Um, was probably about four years where I could say that I, that tightness around my heart that he would ever go back to a nonverbal severe state was gone. <laughs> well, and you know, it's interesting because just from that psychiatrist appointment, my husband and I knew that Alex had ability. We knew it before, but we definitely knew it. We weren't going to let him get no. into a situation where he f started forgetting. He would be things. convinced that he was lesser than. Yeah. Like, I think that's amazing, right? Like you live with your child as, as a parent, you live with your, you lived with your son. You saw the potential of everything he loved, of everything he would put his energy and mind into. You don't need a million interests. You do not need to be well-rounded in our world. You just need to have one interest that you well, absolutely can dive in. And the surprising part is that we only knew his interest to be in music and baseball. But from that day forward, history, science, math, he's like his mother, you know, just give me one plus one and I can do math. But every other area, and he can go back and tell you what happened in the past. And I would say to him, how do you know that? Well, I read it. Mm. And I'd say, and you're sure it's fact? Yeah, you can go Google it, mom. You'll find out. Oh, you read it on Google. No, I found it in a book. And to this day, when it comes to politics, he talks about the history of politics. Wow. <laughs> and my brother said to me one day, I knew he was smart but he's got this brilliant mind, but he doesn't come across being that savant. No. If there's, if there's a way to bring it into a conversation, he will. Um, like he said, since he's living alone, he really doesn't have meltdowns. And I realized why when he lived here, he wanted to spend a lot of time in his room mm. as a parent. Yeah, you want to drag him I, out. I so agree with this. <laughs> you know, and he was in his 20s, you know, and I'm still yeah. saying, can't you come eat with us? Can't you come sit with us? Yeah. We're going to go up to Dairy Queen. Would you? And he'd look at me like, mom, leave me alone. And I always, I was thinking the words, okay? You were bullied today. Something's bothering you. But no. He just, he, I know. That was his safe spot. And after a full day of work, yeah, he needed a safe spot. Um, so to our listeners out there, I mean, I'm so glad that you shared your story, Natalie. I'm also glad that you shared a little bit about what happens in Canada in the medical, uh, because <laughs> we all assume that uh, everything is immediate and free and whatever. And uh, we're learning more and more that nothing is really free in life. Yeah. Um but you found a way to get him to verbalize without all the equipment. And part of that was taking a step back and saying, maybe we haven't been talking directly to him. Maybe there's something else we can do. I yes. love that. It's all about outside the box thinking. That's why I, li I love your maze. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it's true. We have well, to find our own path too. And, you know, when I started the, this podcast, um, I said, I said to my son, I said, now I want you to understand 
we're not going to just talk about autism. We talk about everything. I said, but we are so much like you, Alex, even though you don't realize that mm -hmm. because we look ahead and say, this is what we want to do. And we start going there and all of a sudden there's a wall in front of us and we think we have to stop because there's a wall, but we could go to the left. We could go to the right. We could turn around and go back and take another path. And I said, when you were growing up, I was listening to the doctor saying, you're going to go this path and he's going to take these meds and he's going to do this therapy. And we pulled him out of therapy when he was 14 years old because I was tired of going into therapy, having him make promises to the therapist, get in the car and have him say, that's all bull. I'm not going to do it because I don't believe in it. And I'd be like, I just spent a bundle of money. Right? Yeah. And so when we stopped the therapy, he was much better. Now, in his early 20s, he found somebody that he went to for cognitive therapy, and that made okay. sense to him. He said, yeah, and he's holding me accountable. Whereas when I was younger, they didn't. No. So- there's a lot and of cognitive, and, and and I mean the therapies become very different as you get older. Oh right. They do. Yeah. They and the thing with the capacity is depending on, and that's why this we call it a spectrum, depending on like accessibility within the brain and like what interests and like some kids that are 14 would put, potentially do well with cognitive therapy, but yet they don't really off well, they sometimes do, but sometimes those therapies aren't offered till they're in their right. 20s. It's and at the end of the day, if, if we let them lead us and tell us what they want or where they're, where they're suffering or struggling, then we can match that. But it's so hard when we have teenagers, we don't, we don't, I feel like sometimes, cause I have a teenager now, like, it's like, I don't know how to ask that question so that you understand, not understand, but how it's going to meet you at your level and still make you feel like you're the, the empowered person making the decision, even though you still need me to make most decisions. Right. Exactly. There's like this weird, like yeah. <laughs> in between space. <laughs> well, can you tell my listeners how they can find you and follow you? That would be great. Yes. So at, um, so my website and our website is www.blueliferx.com. And blue is not because of the, of autism. It's actually because of the blue zone. So what I love to promote for autism, for people all doesn't matter autism or not is that we should live by what we know works and so the blue zones are these wonderful pockets in the world where people forget to die and have the best longest and happiest lives okay. so that's what i teach and so and then um on instagram it's instagram at rebel spectrum so r-e-b-e-l-l-e -L -L -E, and then spectrum which I'm sure everybody knows how to spell. Well, we will get that all in the show notes. You've been wonderful. Um, Amazing. Thank you for having me on. Oh, absolutely. And hopefully we'll have you back on again in the future. Yes. That would be I wonderful. I love your story. I love okay. your story. Okay. Bye-bye now.